Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we talk about literature. Today, we're continuing our discussion on Victorian England. In this episode, we'll be covering how the Victorians express themselves as we explore the arts and literature. So let's jump in. So I'm really excited about this because we're getting back to home base for me, and this final video is going to be the jumping off point for us diving in back into individual books and literature. I'm so excited. So Victorians are, throughout my research, were described as being extremely self-conscious, and they were described as being self-conscious even in their own time, which sort of is self-evident of how self-conscious they were. In their contradictions, in their progress, their morality, their reforms, and their doubts, they were aware of studying themselves, of trying to understand themselves, and they were particularly aware of the fact that later generations would study and judge them as well. And they worked all of these questionings and doubts and self-awareness out through literature, poetry, and art, and essays. This should come as no surprise. It's a great tool for figuring out what the heck you even think. Another quote from Longman, their writing is distinguished by its particularity, eccentricity, long-windedness, ever read a Dickens novel? Uh, earnestness, ornateness, fantasy, humor, experimentation, and self-consciousness. They sought to publish moral works, but enjoyed salacious thrillers, body stories, even police reports of lurid crimes. And again, our own society with our interest in true crime fiction or um, exposés, whether it be on Netflix or through podcasts, is very, very similar to this. And there's, again, this almost exploitative nature to these stories that we find both engrossing and fascinating and appalling, right? I think we haven't changed much. The middle class both published and consumed the vast majority of novels. Lending libraries charged fees, kind of like renting a video, um, and pushed for writers to write three deckers, which is basically a trilogy, and that would allow them to get three rental frees as people got the next book. So again, trilogies are kind of huge right now, especially in young adult literature and in fantasy and that sort of thing. So, I, and, I, and I think that's kind of pushed by publishing as well. You get people sort of engrossed in the story and they want to buy the next um, book in the series. And so a trilogy is a really easy way to sort of expand those profits. Um, serialization was also really popular during this time, so individual episodes or chapters would have been published in magazines. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle with his Sherlock stories is a very good example of this. Um, George Eliot published individual chapters, Charles Dickens published individual chapters, and this had a big effect on the form because the books would have been written while they were in the process of being published each little episode at the time. And because authors had almost a celebrity-like status, what the people wanted really would have affected what was going to be published and maybe would have had influence on how the authors chose to write and craft their stories. Um, and so that's a really interesting aspect of how publishing worked at this time. And again, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is a really great example of this. He grew tired of writing the Sherlock Holmes stories far before the, his audience got tired of reading them. He tried to kill off Sherlock Holmes, but it, there was such a huge outcry that he had to kind of like resurrect him and bring him back so he could continue writing these stories. At the same time, understanding Victorian literature requires a really good familiarity with the Bible. Again, a quote from Longman. One single book, alternately discredited and revered, underpinned the whole literary enterprise. The King James Version of the Bible shaped the cadences, supplied the imagery, and proposed the structures through which the Victorians apprehended the universe. Knowledge of it immensely deepens one's appreciation of the time." Yeah, it's huge. If Because even when they're trying to discredit it, it's the thing against which they are arguing. Even when they're struggling with religion, as we have talked briefly about in Thomas Hardy in my um, episode, How to Annotate a Book, his critique of religion is really important, but his critique of religion is a critique of the Christian faith. So you have to understand what the Christian faith believes and in pretty good detail to really get the most out of what this discussion is about. Another quote from Longman. The novels themselves generally explored the relation between individuals and their society through the mechanism of the central love plot. Wives and Daughters follows this, right? 
around which almost any subject could be investigated, including the quest for self-knowledge, religious crises, industrialism, education, women's roles, crime and punishment, or the definition of gentlemanliness. So Wives and Daughters is a really great example of this. It functions around this plot of a marriage plot where we're wondering, are, are our is our hero and heroine going to eventually be able to fall in love and get married? But in that process, they're really investigating what is the society of family life look like? How are the relationships between mothers and fathers and wives and daughters and neighbors and cousins? Really, how are they constructed and navigated? Similarly, um, Thomas Hardy, as we talked about with uh, Jude the Obscure. Um, that novel also has a central love plot where we're wondering is t this main character Jude going to fall in love and have a successful relationship with his main love interest. In the process we're investigating this religious crisis and also this social crisis where there is no social mobility. Um, and so all of these novels a lot of these novels are using this central marriage plot as, a, as the structure through which they explore many deeper ideas. So even though it's a love story or a romance, don't let that deceive you. It's that they're really talking about something much more, uh, much deeper than just falling in love. And that in itself is worth investigating as well. That's not to say that falling in love or a romance story is a bad thing. But what was art for? The Victorians also grappled with the value of art to society. So utilitarians, who was one popular worldview at the time, really considered it a waste of time. What is the ut use or the utility of art? It's frivolous in that worldview. Evangelicals considered it sentimental and fanciful, distracting from the moral state or the moral state of life or the question of the soul and um, pursuing a good spiritual life. Others considered it the last defense against uh, a chaos in the world that was questioning the philosophical foundations of everything they believed in. So if, if you rip out the Christian faith as being the foundation for their moral framework and you're now faced with Darwinism, with nature being red in tooth and claw, and social Darwinism being the law of the land for our social engage engagement, then this more atheistic or agnostic framework demanded something that would justify kindness and compassion in their worldview. And many turned to art and literature for that as the playground for these ideas of humanity. Um, and they wanted to know what art should be made. The novel, poetry, and essays were extremely popular. For the most art, for the most art, that's not what I'm trying to say. For the most part, stories were set in the past. Um, so some pe preferred like Greco-Roman themes, others preferred calling back to Arthurian legends. There were, there were two really popular times in the distant past to call back to. Um, while others like Dickens set them sort of just in the previous generation in what would have been their parents' generation. Um, while others like Elizabeth Barrett Browning said that it was the present that needed to be investigated and the present that needed to be represented and grappled with. Theater really struggled at, to find purchase until late in the era we get Oscar Wilde and George Bernard Shaw. So these are two of the preeminent writers at that time, but for the most part there's not a lot of um, really profound theater that's happening. Painting, we had the pre-Raphaelites who were a huge movement and they were medievalists. They often used um, Arthurian type themes to explore their ideas. While we also really get the burgeoning of a lot of narrative scenes in, set in the modern times. And on top of that, we almost get the early development of Impressionism. So one painter who's really famous for this and also for writing a defensive of this less representative and narrative art is James Whistler, who came onto the scene. But above all, it's really the golden age of the novel. We have Dickens, Eliot, the Brontes, Henry James, Gaskell, the Brownings, Doyle, Kipling, Carroll, and so many more authors who are publishing really famous works that are enduring even to today. One thing that the Longman Anthology also observed is that what was popular at the time continues to be what we consider valuable and has really stood the test of time, which really shows what keen readers the Victorians were in their time. Even today I find myself reading a lot of books that are popular and I truly enjoy them, but I know that they're not going to stand the test of time and become classic literature in the future, and I think that we could really learn from them and be keener readers ourselves. So. That's what I have for you today on arts and literature in the Victorian era. This whole series, this is the final episode in this series. 
If there are other topics that you think I missed that I should have covered in my historical and cultural examination of Victorian England, please leave it in the comments down below. Next week, we will be kicking it off with The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. We'll be doing a primer episode, so it's going to be completely spoiler-free. It's going to give you some topics to look out for as you're reading it, and it's intended for you to watch before you get started reading the novel, and so you can get more out of the book when you do read it. Um, and then, of course, we're going to follow up with our normal topical episodes where I go in-depth and examine different concepts in the novel. Um, if you get value from the, out of these uh, episodes, again, please consider giving it a like or um, subscribe to my channel. It really helps me out. And if you want to further support the channel, consider becoming a patron. For just $1, you can actually get access to my full slide deck for this whole series, as well as every other series that I've created on my channel. So that's a really great resource for students if you're looking for additional resources or maybe you're reviewing um, as you're coming to the close of the, uh, of the year. I don't know, tests, studying stuff. Um, link is in the description as always. And again, get ready for Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte that's coming at you next week. Until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.